Thank you all so much. Let's get started. All right. So you and I, we're going to go on a little bit of a time travel. We're going to go way back to the 1980s. Now, I know some of you may not have been born then, and some of you may have decided to completely forget the 1980s. And the rest of you are probably thinking, this woman couldn't have even been like, around in the 80s. Now, I was, I promise. So anyway, now, back in the 80s, this is a picture of a Commodore 64. This is one of the first computers I ever used. I wrote my first program on this computer. It came out in the early 80s. This was the first version of PowerPoint, 1987, before PowerPoint was sold to Microsoft. Many of you may have used this software, maybe created your first data visualizations with it. And this, does anyone know what this is? It looks like a few. Exactly. Now, in 1983, this was the future. This is a visualization from the film War Games. In War Games, Matthew Broderick hacks into the Defense Department computers, and he launches what he thinks is a nuclear attack from the USSR onto the United States. In this visualization, you can see the path of the intercontinental ballistic missiles as they come across and crash into the United States, starting World War III. Now, as I look at this visualization, as all of you are now in 2010, I think to myself, like, this is pretty cool. I could probably build this myself now, maybe build a cool Google Maps mashup. But what's so inspiring here, I think, is that this is from 27 years ago. So 27 years ago, we were thinking, this is what the future would look like. I mean, granted, War Games was set in the Cold War era, but Hollywood shows us the future. And that's, I think, the real beautiful thing about movies, is movies are designed without implementation. You don't have to worry about technology. You don't have to worry about how to actually build it. You just have to show it. You put your wildest imagination up on the big screen, and you let it loose. Now, let's come back to 2010. I know, a little disappointing. Now, think about the last presentation you watched. Think about the presenter and how they presented the data. I have a feeling that they might have used one of, I feel like Vanna White, one of these charts right here. Pie chart, line chart, or bar chart. Now, if we thought in 1983 that the future would be these cool maps, and we're still using these types of data visualizations, that kind of sucks. And it's not really inspiring. And whenever I see these sites of charts, I'm kind of like, you know, something inside of me dies. Um, you know, <laughs> The bottom line, we can do better than this. Every one of you can do better than this. Now, when I was creating this talk, I'd like to say last week, but it may have been yesterday, and I was doing this Google search for, I wanted to see what images came up when I searched Google for data. I wanted to see what everyone was talking about and thinking about when they were, when they were visualizing data. This was the most popular search result. This is from a government website. Um, enough said. And this was the second most popular image on Google. Now, I looked at both of these images, and I had an epiphany. We are in data purgatory between cartoons and the matrix. We don't know how to display our data, so we're kind of wandering around in this no man's land. We want to be like Minority Report. I'm sure all of us have seen Minority Report. Tom Cruise gets up. He has this fantastic uh, uh, visualization kind of interface. It wraps around. We all want to be like Tom Cruise. Maybe we don't want to be completely like Tom Cruise, but we would love to have that set up in our desk. I mean, that would be pretty sweet. Like, you get to work, and this is your work. That would be awesome. But then here's the problem. This is what we want, and this is what we get. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it scares me. And, and what's worse is that this is how we interact with it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are trapped in Tron. We're sitting in front of our 2D, visuals, our 2D interfaces. We're interacting with data. It's very simple. It's not exciting. I mean, the bottom line is that flat data visualization will not work anymore because data is fundamentally different than it was 30 years ago. 
We've got audio, we've got video, we've got geolocation, we've got multimodal rich dynamic data coming in real time. We've got big data, we've got small data. How are we going to show that data? Well, this isn't going to work anymore. Tron is out. Um, you know, so I was thinking a lot about this problem. And I'm obviously very passionate about it. I get really excited. You guys can probably see that. Um, and I was like, oh, you know. What's next? Well, first, we decided to go to maps. So this is a brilliant visualization New York Times did of the oil spill. They put all that data on a map. I thought this was a great move forward. It was interactive. It was dynamic, much better than the bar charts. Awesome. Now, I do a lot of data viz work myself. Um, and I started visualizing meetings from different IBM sites around the world. Now, so this was a very early prototype that I built of which countries collaborate and meet with what other countries, and what time do they do it? So I was very interested in the fact that IBM is a New York headquartered company. Do we always revolve around East Coast time? You know, the world, is the world really working around East Coast time? So I was, I was playing around with this, and the dots mean that they're meetings, and I was like, you know what? This kind of, this kind of doesn't, this kind of sucks. And, you know, it sucks because there's so much distortion in this map. Like, look at the South Pole. That doesn't look too good. The North Pole, that doesn't look so good either. Y Europe looks kind of itty-bitty. And I was like, we can, do, we can do better than this. Like, if, if I'm a researcher and I want to do something cutting edge, this, this isn't going to cut it. So I did what many of you probably will have done yourself. I bought a seven-foot sphere. And I decided I'm going to take my maps and I'm going to put them on the sphere. This is a picture from when we installed the sphere in the lobby of our research center. It actually wouldn't fit through the door. And that's a whole other long story that I could tell you about later. Um, as, as New Yorkers, you're probably familiar with this problem. And so we, we took every single geographic or geo-encoded data set that we could get our hands on, and we started putting it on the globe. Um, this includes Twitter, Foursquare, et cetera. We did some really interesting stuff around pandemic modeling. And, and I thought this was perhaps the most pervasive use case, where we wanted to see how swine flu spread this past winter. And as we're investigating new paradigms in 3D and how people interact with 3D surfaces, we made this an interactive visualization where you could see what happens to swine flu if airports close. If Atlanta's a huge airport, so it's Heathrow, especially that impact international travel. What happens if people can't get out of the airports? What happens if people can't take their kids to school and the, and the um, schools close? Because we all know, unfortunately, that often disease spreads through school children. So we were messing around with all this cool stuff, and, and, and we had all these great ideas. Um, and something else I also wanted to show you was when you have a three-dimensional object, you can also get views that you couldn't get on a flat 2D map. So here you're looking down on the North Pole, and you can see Northern Europe. And this isn't a view that you usually get. I mean, yes, you could build a map that looks like this, but rarely do you ever see it. And this comes in really uh, handy when you're visualizing flight patterns, especially transcontinental flight patterns. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a visualization of that, but I thought that was super cool. And then. So we had this thing installed, and we're playing with it, and we're putting all these neat data sets on it. And then something really interesting happened. Um, a lot of the fellow researchers I work with were like, Julia, we want to put our data on here. We've got like, this sweet data set. And I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And then some of the salespeople came to me, and they were like, we want to put our data on here. And I was like, hell yeah. And, I was, and then I'm like, so what is your data? And they're like, PowerPoint. And, I was, and I'm thinking to myself, like, hmm. And so, it kind of looked like something like this. So, and unfortunately, what happened here is if you take something that was created in 2D and you render it on a 3D surface, you get distortion. If you're, if you're taking data that's generated in a 3D world similarly and putting it on a 2D surface, you get distortion. Jumps and reductions in dimensionality equal distortion and inaccuracy. So, we did this, and it was, and it was interesting, to say the least. Um, but what's important here, and the point I want to drive home, is that you know, data is constantly changing. And it's constantly getting more exciting. And we're adding new ways to interact with data. We're adding more data. And interfaces are always going to fall behind. But that is where all the creativity is. That's where you can define, and you can create new paradigms, and you can experiment with technology that's kind of cutting edge, and, and you can really do things that you never would have been able to do before, and you can have a lot of impact. I'm going to leave you with Avatar. You know, 
This visualization may be the future. You know, this is the cutting, this is the latest and greatest. We may think like, oh, this is, you know, this is decades away. But you know, it may not be as far away as you think. Um, the future will be here very soon. Thank you so much.